Please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Welcome to Overdrive. You're watching the show with me, so you need that. Now, in a busy metro like ours, we end up spending a lot of time just commuting and sitting idle in the driver's seat, just uh, waiting to cut down on those kilometers. So it comes as no surprise that automatic cars have been taking precedence. Now, we have identified three compact uh, sedans this week on the show and Rohit will tell you more. Because it's been almost 10 years now for the compact sedan genre, you know, the cars have really improved a lot. They've become a lot more premium, a lot more desirable, even if it sounds cliched. And so today we are going to find out which is the better one of the three. We have three automatic ones with us. They come with the frugality of a diesel motor, convenience of an automatic. But all three automatics are quite different. Yeah. So let's find out so which is the better one. Can we start off with yeah. the Honda? Amaze, that's the newest one. Let's yes, do it. let's do it. The Honda Amaze is now in its second generation, is improved by leaps and bounds and now comes with a diesel CVT. The Suzuki Desire on the other hand has moved into its third generation and gets the latest AMT gearbox that is quite impressive. And finally, the Volkswagen Ameo, which has arrived late to the compact sedan party but brought with it the telepathic DSG transmission. So let's see how the three cars fared against each other. The newest entrant on the block comes with a diesel engine and a CVT gearbox that Honda is really proud about. We'll come to that in a bit, but the last time you drove a CVT was on this very road where we almost lost a GoPro with a Micra. <laughs> that was a Micra CVT. This is uh, Honda's new CVT. Your thoughts on the gearbox? I think this is absolutely seamless. There's no pause in the shifts. So what you said was actually right. You don't feel the shifts at all and that's, uh, that's the beauty of the CVT. But what I really appreciate with the Amaze CVT is that CVTs inherently have that rubber band effect mm. where uh, you feel that the engine is just revving, 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 revving and then it shifts to the next uh, ratio. But here you don't, you don't feel that. Here uh, they've reduced that rubber band effect to a great extent. And I think when you're driving in the city and like right now when you get a chance to, uh, you know, really stretch the legs of the car, it, it really feels nice. Frugal 1.5 litre diesel engine of the Amaze, which puts out 100 PS of power and 200 Newton meters of torque, is detuned to 80 PS and 160 Newton meters for the CVT application, in a bid to give the seamless shifts that we have just appreciated. Surprisingly, the tuning works so well that you don't feel the torque deficit while driving in the city and pulling overtakes isn't a problem at all either. It is only on the highway that the overtakes take a while. The car cruises effortlessly at highway speeds though, but feels a bit floaty at speed. But in terms of cabin, you know, this is where you spend most of your time when you're, uh, we're, we're talking about convenience in the city, you're talking about traffic jams, yeah. right, like in Mumbai. So you are going to spend a lot of time in the cabin, sitting at, in those traffic jams, especially in the monsoons. So how the cabin looks, how it looks and feels, the features, Everything makes a lot of difference. Yeah. So what are your impressions about the cabin of the Amaze? I was actually going to ask you the same question that what do you think about the cabin because as far as I see the infotainment system is a slight drawback. Yes, it, it, it feels is. a little dated. It makes me feel a little short change because now we are used to you know, touchscreen devices and yeah. uh, more feature rich infotainment systems, colourful systems. Here this feels very basic, you know, just three lines of text and it feels quite basic. It feels like a step back. But I think the overall design of the the cabin is really nice. It it's feels quite nice. premium. It doesn't feel it like does. an entry-level sedan anymore. And I think that's a that's a big draw for uh, the Amaze. Just that I would have liked a better infotainment system as well. So what do you think, Rohit? Does this cabin give you the feel of being very spacious? And very comfortable in this? I think it is quite spacious, yes. It is more spacious than the outgoing car for sure. And uh, it does feel uh, quite comfortable. We drove it in Hyderabad as well and I really like the overall comfort. Honda has worked a great deal on the noise insulation and the drivetrain clatter has been cut down by a great extent when you're driving around in the city. Over bad roads though, there's plenty of road and debris noise that you hear inside the cabin. The rear seat also has a loud booming sound at highway speeds, again highlighting the fact that this is more of a city car than a highway cruiser. That said, Honda has done a commendable job with their ride comfort and it is easily one of the best in this category. So now, Desire, AMT, your thoughts? I absolutely 
absolutely love it uh, rohit i have actually driven uh, the celerio amt a while nice. back and uh, initially that head nod effect that the car has True. it took a while getting used to and i wasn't too sure about it but i was expecting that in the desire as well and it's reduced quite a bit yeah quite a bit in fact right i'm quite happy with this and the the main thing is that it doesn't feel very sluggish you know it just goes immediately it after gets off the line yeah exactly like we saw right now it gets off the line quicker yeah. and even overtakes in the city are quite quick yeah. in fact interesting you mentioned the celerio because uh, that happened to be the first vehicle from maruti suzuki that had the amt or the auto gear shift like they call it and from there till uh, to this desire it's it's been a long journey and i think it's uh, quite a nice one for them because the change is evident right yeah. that head nod effect that we all keep talking about in the amt is reduced to such a great extent uh, in the desire which i think is a is a big positive uh, for the car the lightweight construction of this car gives you the perception of speed though this package is the slowest to the ton and in its roll on acceleration that is down to the engine being the least powerful of this test but the amt comes closest to offering the responsive feel of a manual transmission and that makes it quite easy to drive in the city once you factor in the pause between the shifts mash the throttle and the desire is also ready to drop two gears to build up speed but like the amaze roll on acceleration at highway speeds takes longer than you would like more importantly now you have moved from the amaze to this car you also have a couple of maruti suzuki that you own yourself a lot of common parts between all the cars but what do you feel about the cabin of the desire in particular because it feels quite premium and uh, i love the music system especially because it's you know it's yeah. in uh, sync with times it's got uh, the latest uh, what apple car play system. yeah it's got uh, smartphone interface uh, built in both the other cars unfortunately don't have it what i don't like though is this forward finish i don't know it just looks a little i don't know out of place to me It's, it's like a matter it, of taste, I guess. You don't like it. I actually don't. I don't have know. I just feel that the car is trying too hard to look premium. That's the only thing I don't like. But I like the uh, the flat bottom steering wheel. It looks a little sporty, but again, that forward is and like that flying on. Everything is very clean, like, right? Everything. Yes, the layout clean. is very clean, which is something that uh, we have seen on uh, most new Maruti Suzuki cars, including the Brezza that you drive. The layout is simple. The layout has uh, that simplistic, minimalistic air to it, which I think really works well. The desire handles pretty well for a compact sedan too, but the lightweight construction also makes it feel a tad too light-footed around bends, especially with the skinny tires. It isn't unnerving, but something you need to factor in before engaging in some fun around twisty roads. Oh, and when you do, move to the manual mode on the gearbox. But speaking of handling and fun dynamics, is the next car in the test that takes the cake, the Volkswagen Aveo. Lois, before you say anything, I just have to say that this is extremely noisy. I know what you're talking about. This uh, engine on startup at idling, when you get going, that gravelly note is just so pronounced. I mean, the 1.3 liter motor in the Swift Desire, it's an aging dinosaur, and even that doesn't feel as noisy as this, right? I mean, now after driving these cars back to back, yes, this is quite noisy, but it's just the noise. When you're driving it, I'm sure you're not really feeling any vibrations in the pedal. The drivetrain refinement in that sense is not that bad. Uh, let's first talk about the drivetrain. Like you said, it's a little noisy, but the kind of gearbox that you get with it, a DSD, don't you think it's more impressive? Uh, mixed I, reactions, I see. Mixed reactions, simply because I feel it's it's really slow. You know, uh, like look at us, we're just getting off on the signal, but it's just it's just not pulling. Which is a surprise, really, because uh, this is not the slowest car of this test. When you go pedal to the metal, zero to hundred is not the slowest. Its drivability is also quite good, but yeah, you're right. I mean, at city speeds, it does feel a little sluggish to get off the mark. Even drivability in the city speeds, you know, there's that. Despite this being a DSD, there is that head nod, you know, and that's not something that uh, that I really appreciate. I mean, I expected better, but once you go out on the highway. Yeah. Or when you're hitting the twisties, that DSD is an absolute gem. Then it really becomes telepathic. You know, it, you don't even have to resort to the manual override. It really works so well, especially out on the highway. The engine runs so relaxed. Even pulling overtakes at highway speeds is so much easier than in the other two cars. And I think that is what the whole uh, peg of this car is. 
It really feels nice on the highway and it even feels quite stable on the highway. Right. Unlike the other two which because of the lightweight uh, tend to uh, you know feel a little floaty beyond 120 130 km an hour. This feels nicely hunkered down. This feels stable even at highway speeds. I think this I is one of the best cabins in this lot. Yeah. I think it really has that premium feel to it. You know all these uh, satin finished inserts and the chrome inserts. I think all of that is very nicely done, very tastefully done. None of it is uh, you know overdone. Nothing is in your face. It's not minimalist like we had in the the Swift design. It's not minimalist. Yeah. There is still a lot of switches around and you know the the the, the system is really small. It's not uh, really the the large system that the large truck screen that you get in the The Amaze was the most basic. The Amaze was the most basic, but I think yeah, but yeah. This has a nice air to it. It's got a premium air to it and that gives a lot of feel good factor. So if driving fun is what you seek, the Amio easily trumps the other two in that department. The meaty mid-range of this engine means that you never really feel a dearth of power whether you're driving in the city or out on the highway. The heavy construction of the car makes it feel sluggish though, but we will take a look at the numbers in a bit and you will know that it actually isn't. The ride quality of the Amio is quite nice too. It has a bit of that European firmness, but the ride isn't bone jarring. Hit the twisties and you will be impressed at how little the body roll is. The cabin of the Amio is quite pleasant too and looks and feels upmarket. The only fly in the ointment is the rear seat comfort. So in a nutshell, the Amaze and the Desire are better suited as city commuters, while if it's highway cruising or highway touring that you're looking at, it would have to be the Amio. While we're on the subject, let's take a quick look at how these cars stack up on the features and creature comforts. Whether you're driving in the city or touring on the highway, safety is paramount, and here is how these three cars compare on that front. Finally, let's take a look at the specifications and the numbers that they manage to churn out. Finally, fuel economy is a big concern for automatics, so let's get that bit out of the way. The Ames and the Desire are impressive in the city, whereas the Ameo isn't. But out on the highway, the Ameo again shows its highway prowess. Well, all the three cars are quite closely matched in their overall appeal, and each one of them has unique facets that work in their favor. However, we are on the topic of the frugality of a diesel motor with the convenience of an automatic, and there the Ames simply takes a superb lead over its rivals. The drivetrain is hard to falter and in the second generation that Amaze has now literally leapfrogged in terms of its quality, in terms of its features, in terms of its overall space as well. So in my books is the clear winner of this test. Our four tastes of the Kia Motors cars continues. In fact, this week we got a chance to drive Kia Rio X-Line which is a crossover based on the Rio hatchback. Rohit will tell you more. We are in Russia to drive a few cars thanks to Kia. And one of the cars that we are driving today is the Rio X-Line, something similar to the i20 Active. Let's take a look. In theory, the Rio X-Line is to the Rio hatch what the i20 Active is to the Elite i20, and then some. The Rio and the Elite i20 are platform siblings too, but the Kia Rio isn't a sub 4 meter hatchback. The Rio X line is even bigger by being 175 mm longer, 25 mm wider and 60 mm taller than the Rio hatch. It even boasts of a 20 mm longer wheelbase. These dimensions give it a large, wide-bodied and upmarket stance over the other premium hatchbacks that we have come to like in the Elite i20, Balino and the Jazz. In fact, the Rio X line is larger even than the Jazz, which we often like to call a mini MPV. So you get the picture. It is a spacious car and to draw parallels, it is much like the S-Cross. Compared to the Rio hatchback, it wears a more rugged cladding all around and hence the X-Line suffix. The Russians particularly like that sort of a thing since it provides additional protection for the metal parts against corrosive debris that the region's snowy and rainy weather likes to kick up very often. Think of it to be similar to a protective bumper for your phone's shiny bezels. Things like the roof rails and the scuff plates complete the beefy look. The Rio X-Line also rides higher than its hatchback counterpart, sitting on a 170mm ground clearance compared to the hatchback's 150mm. 
that not only works better in theory against potholes and speed humps, but also makes easier ingress and egress compared to what I remember of the low-riding Rio that I drove in New Delhi. The larger exterior dimensions of this car also translate to a roomier cabin inside. Despite all the darker colors that have been used, you have a nice airy feel in here. Now, comparisons with the i20 are inevitable. We've always said that the i20 has a very premium feel to its cabin. It feels much better than some of its competition. And this car actually takes it a couple of notches higher. If you look at the switch gear, the overall fit and finish, it actually feels slightly better than the i20, which is a good thing. The infotainment is similar to the Elite i20s, is, is compatible with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, and the audio quality from the six-speaker setup is comparable to its Hyundai sibling. Our car only came with one USB port and more would be welcome in this day and age. Our drive was quite brief too and was restricted to the outer ring road around Moscow. It is a pity that Moscow doesn't have many mountain roads as I was really keen on hitting the twisties with this car and explore its sporty vibe further. The drivetrain certainly stirs up those expectations as the 1.6-litre 123PS four-cylinder petrol engine is eager as always and a lot punchier than the 1-litre unit that we sampled in the Rio hatchback. We have experienced this 1.6-litre gamma petrol in the Hyundai Werner. And in the lighter Rio X line, it's even more delightful to drive. The six-speed automatic transmission is quite nice too, and it's quick to downshift when you dab the throttle even at highway speeds. It is a bit slow to get off the line though, but its performance at city speeds is quite smooth. Unsurprisingly, the Rio X line feels a little bit better than the hatchback that we drove, and that left us impressed. It is quite a likable package for its drivetrain refinement, space, and well-appointed cabin. It also looks sportier than its hatchback counterpart. We believe that Kia is watching this space quite closely for its engine operations. A premium hatchback or a low-riding crossover is certainly on the cards then, but it will be interesting to see if the car maker decides to go with the flow and creates a sub 4 meter hatchback to keep prices and specs competitive, or takes the game forward by introducing a larger and more premium alternative to the best hatchbacks currently on offer in India. I strongly believe that our market is now ready for the latter. Well, we have to wait for a year for Kia Motors to finally bring down its first product down in India. Let's take a look at what happened this week. It was a very good week for two-wheel manufacturers. It started off with BMW Motorrad. They launched their smallest motorcycles in the Indian market at a very competitive price. And Suzuki Two-Wheelers has also brought in the first maxi scooter in the country. Take a look. BMW Motorrad has launched two of its smallest premium motorcycles in India this week. The G310R, a street naked motorcycle, is priced at 2.99 lakh rupees ex showroom Delhi, and the Adventure Toro BMW G310GS has been priced at 3.49 lakh rupees ex showroom Delhi. At this price point, the 310R will be competing with the KTM 390 Duke and the GS with the 390 Duke Adventure when it launches in India. As per the BMW Motorrad TVS collaboration since 2013, 90% of the bike parts have been locally sourced from Indian suppliers and built at TVS's Horsur plant. Both the G310R and G310GS are powered by a 313cc liquid-cooled single-cylinder engine that liberates 34 PS at 9500 rpm and generates 28 Nm at 7500 rpm. This motor is paired to a 6-speed transmission and both motorcycles feature a high-performance brake system with two-channel anti-lock braking system. Top speed for both motorcycles is claimed to be 143 km per hour and they clock 2.5 seconds in a 0-50 to 50 km per hour run. At present, BMW has nine dealerships running all across the country and is offering standard warranty of three years to all customers. In the near future, Chandigarh, Hyderabad, Indore and Kolkata too will start accepting bookings once the dealerships are in place. Earlier this week, India welcomed its first maxi scooter in the country, the Suzuki Bergman Street at 68,000 X showroom Delhi. At this price point, this premium maxi scooter rivals the Honda Grazia, the TVS N-Talk and the Aprilia SR125. 
The scooter is based on its popular sibling, the Suzuki Access 125, but weighs 7 kilos heavier. What distinguishes the Bergman as a maxi scooter is an extra long seat, LED headlights and tail lamps and a massive underseat storage of 21.5 litres. The scooter also shares the Access 125's powertrain and mechanicals, so the performance numbers remain identical, which is 9 PS and 10.2 Newton meters. The company has already started taking bookings for the Bergman Street for a token amount of 5,000 rupees across all dealerships in India. We'd like some feedback on what you thought of this particular show as well as our stories. So send them to us via Facebook or Twitter. Follow our latest videos on our YouTube channel. Also follow the latest updates from the team on Instagram. We'll see you next week. Until then, goodbye and many thanks for watching.